Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us at the celebration of our graduation, their accomplishments on this very unusual year. All of you should be very proud to have survived and to know that forevermore you will be touched by the suffering and the deaths that you saw while your early clinical experiences were taking place. We, recommend, we welcome you and your loved ones, the few that are here, and all of the people who are on some kind of connection out there in the world watching us. Let me introduce the very few small platform today. President Stuart Rabinowitz, Provost Herman Berlitta, Mr. Michael Dowling, Vice Dean David Battinelli, Dr. Betty Diamond, and Dr. Ellen Perlman. And to the family members, we apologize for the oddness of this year and the odd way that you're spread out across this uh, sports arena, but we are certainly happy to have a graduation in person, and thank you for being here. <clears throat> So a little bit about the year in our school. First of all, we survived COVID both as a health system, a university, and as a medical school extraordinarily well. You will forever remember COVID as the signature event of your medical school, but it was accompanied by unrest in our country and a vivid, uh, vivid display of the lack of equity in the country affecting medical care, health, life, and death. For the first time ever, I think it was vividly clear that courage was an essential virtue of all doctors. We used to think sometimes that it was uh, just something that maybe if you had it, it was okay. But it's very clear in COVID that you cannot be a doctor without courage. And we saw suffering and death both in numbers and in ways that we had never experienced before. I will tell you personally that touring the ICUs in the first wave of COVID, I personally had never seen an ICU with no sound except the ventilators. No one was talking. There were no visitors for any patient. Every patient was flipped over on his, uh, his or her stomach prone, sedated completely to unconsciousness, and there was absolutely no human sounds as people just lie there, and in that first wave, 90% of those patients died. And I think it took an enormous amount of strength for the medical profession, the nurses, the doctors, and the people who were immersed in that to come out whole. And hopefully, we all will come out better for all of it. And yet, look at our medical school this year. We went up in all of the national rankings. We were, we were given the honor of being one of the two most diverse medical schools in the state of New York and one of the leading diversity institutions in the country. And we just found out this week that Northwell Health was named as the number one diverse corporation in the United States. We, <clears throat> Your class gave us another fantastic match day. Uh, and we have an unprecedented applicant pool to come to our school next year in both numbers and qualifications like we have never seen. And so, despite all of the stressors on healthcare and the Northeast and our particular institutions, this has been an amazing year for all of us. So, a couple of things. In your programs is a list of the traditional awards that we gave out on award day. But we didn't have award day today because we limit the number of in-person uh, breaches in the, in the COVID protocol. Uh, we will announce when the people are called up for their diploma that they were indeed the winners of the specific awards. But I just wanted to point out to you that uh, one way of finding out whether you won anything or not is to look at the program. Uh, the awards are departmental awards and school awards. Uh, the school awards this year, we have a new leadership award, uh, which was funded. And then, of course, the Branson Sparks Humanism Award. And for those of you who don't know, I'll just continue to remind everyone, Branson Sparks was a member of the first year class. And 
He died of uh, a malignancy, uh, barely completing his second year of medical school. And his parents and his classmates, in honor of him, funded this award because Branson was a unique and special individual. And all of his classmates recognized that. And they wanted his humanism, both through his classwork, his collegiality, and his terminal illness, to be celebrated by the people who win the Humanism Award at graduation. Everybody should look and see that people are wearing medals and cords. These things symbolize all kinds of different things. Blue ribbon is distinction in research. Gold is for the Gold Humanism Society. Green and gold for Alpha Omega Alpha, the Medical Honor Society. Blue and gold for departmental awards. Black and silver for certificates of special proficiency, such as ultrasound, uh, and blue for medical Spanish. Black and gold for the CLAR Leadership Awards for that developmental and innovation management program. And the pins have, are associated with many professional and student medical organizations. Uh, and you can look in the program, but uh, many of the students are wearing multiple pins. In addition, we did not get the chance to honor our Teachers of the Year this year. So I want to commend your class because I think it shows incredible good taste in who you nominated for these awards. So it should have come as no surprise to anyone that Dr. David Elkowitz was named by your class the winner of the first 100 weeks Teacher of the Year. <clears throat> And all of you know that David is not only a spectacular teacher who can turn a large group session into something that is stimulating, terrifying, exciting, uh, and uh, like no other experience you had, but that he never stopped teaching through a horrific series of illnesses. And thank goodness is now well, and I'm sure watching us. So David, congratulations. And for the second 100 weeks, you named Dr. Tim Kreider, the Clerkship Director for Psychiatry, our number one clerkship year after year. Uh, and I, once again, I thank you for that, and congratulations to Tim Kreider. I now ask you to please rise as we begin our seventh graduation ceremony of the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell with a recorded invocation from Rabbi Axelrod Chaplain, Long Island Jewish Medical Center. Almighty God, known by many names, heard in many voices, we invoke your presence with us this day. Today, we celebrate the accomplishments of those who receive diplomas, their instructors, mentors, and family, all those who supported them so that they may achieve the goal of becoming a physician. Of those who begin new chapters in their lives, we invoke your blessing upon them. May you give them direction, strength, and acumen to heal their patients, find new ways to alleviate suffering, and discover the cures and prevention of the illnesses that we face today and that have not yet been eradicated or even controlled. Make each mindful, we pray, of what they have accomplished you have chosen them to be among the special people who have the Herculean task to give hope and help those who are suffering return to a normal existence. Bless the instructors who have given up themselves in ways that will only be understood with the passage of time. Families have sacrificed much, friends who learned from them and taught them as only peers can. We ask special blessing to those who administer our institution. We pray for the security of our nation, for the safety of those who defend freedom, whoever and wherever they are. Make us ever mindful of those whose shoulders we stand, as well as those who follow in our path. Even as we celebrate accomplishment and transition, may we continue to seek wisdom. Hear our prayer, and we all say, Amen. Amen. And now please remain standing as Shruti Cody, one of our graduates, leads us in the singing of our national anthem. Oh, 
say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail by the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous night or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof to the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled Could everyone please be seated? I would like to now invite Stuart Rabinowitz, president of Hofstra University, to join me at the podium for a few introductory remarks. Thank you, Dr. Smith. It's my privilege, my absolute privilege, to welcome all of you to the seventh graduating ceremony for the seventh class of the Barbara and Donald Zucker School of Medicine. I welcome all of you who are here, all of, your, all of the graduates and all of your family and friends, and I welcome everyone who's viewing this virtually, including, I am told, a special acknowledgement to Barbara and Donald Zucker. This ceremony, as strange as this arena may look to me, it actually looks like the, one of our basketball games with not heavy attendance, but this is a remarkable occasion. And we are thrilled, and I am personally thrilled, that after more than 15 months of being apart, of being distanced, we can actually come together in person to celebrate your graduation from medical school. If this pandemic has taught us everything, and unfortunately has taught us a lot, it has served as a reminder of the heroism, as Dean Smith talked about, the courage and the heroism of those who served others and serve others through healing. You are entering the field of medicine at a critical time when the need for competent and compassionate care has never been in, as important or more important. And this celebration itself, our being able to be here in person, is a tribute to the scientists and doctors who have steered us through the storms of the past year and help us get to this point, to a point where perhaps we can see, perhaps barely, but we can see the beginnings of a return to what we've known as normal. So we are fortunate to be here together, even masked. It looks like we all robbed the bank. We are fortunate to be here this afternoon to celebrate the accomplishments and the hard work of you, our remarkable graduates, and the sacrifices that have been made on your behalf by your family and friend, friends. The end of this academic year marks my 51st year in higher education and here at Hofstra University, and indeed my final year as the president of Hofstra. I have had the privilege of seeing six classes before you go through the rigors of the Zucker School of Medicine from start to finish, from becoming EMTs to matching with some of the best healthcare and hospitals in the entire world. And I say this because medical school commencements are particularly meaningful to me. I love all commencements, but the medical school commencements are very, very 
meaningful. First, because this dynamic and successful medical school started as a unique partnership between Hofstra University and Northwell Health during my tenure as president. Many, many people at the time said it couldn't be done. But Michael Dowling and I have had the honor and privilege of watching this medical school grow from an idea to a plan to a building and then to all the people that make a school come alive, the students, the faculty, the physicians. Secondly, this is very meaningful to me because my own daughter is a physician and I feel that I, have, I actually lived through her years of medical school with her and therefore I absolutely paid for them too, but I felt I lived with them. And I know firsthand from my experience with my own daughter about how hard each of you has worked to get to this day. And, and frankly, I am in awe of what you've accomplished. I am in awe of your success, and I am tremendously proud of you. The class of 2021 has matched with the best and most prominent hospitals in the nation. That is so astonishing for a medical school which is only graduating its seventh class. The only thing I walk around proudly displaying more often than that piece of paper which lists all your residency matches, and I will show it to strangers or anybody I bunk into. The only thing I display more are my iPhone pictures of Jack Benjamin Rabinowitz, my four and a half year old grandson. Like you, a child prodigy, without a doubt. By the way, his career path in medicine is all mapped out for him, so he doesn't have to worry. More generally, I want to tell you how much I admire the career you've chosen. You've chosen a life's work of healing and relieving human suffering and serving others. To be a great physician, you know, requires intelligence, tenacity, dedication and hard work, and also empathy for your patients as human beings. And we all are confident that the members of the class of 2021 will be great physicians. So contrary to the expect expectations of some of you, I'm not going to use your graduation as an occasion to give you career advice. I do have actually an encyclopedic knowledge of diseases and their symptoms. But I didn't acquire that as a medical professional. I acquired that as a lifelong hypochondriac. So I'm not going to give you career advice, but the next speakers are so well qualified to do so that I'm happy to leave it to them. Indeed, I will close my remarks today. I have, as I have for the past 19 years, of this, as president of this great university. And that is, I want to wish every one of our graduates well. I wish each of you all the success you think you need and all that your talent and your hard work earned for you. I wish you the perspective to forgive yourself and learn from the mistakes, because mistakes are inevitable. And I especially wish that you will be able to find the time in your incredibly busy professional life for the love of family and friends. This pandemic has surely made clear to us that we need to cherish every minute that we spend with our loved ones and our friends. The School of Medicine class of 2021 leaves here with our admiration and our affection. We hope you will maintain your ties to your classmates and, of course, to your alma mater. And from this day forward, your accomplishments will always be the most important driver of the value of our education. The university and the health system will always welcome you back home. On behalf of the faculty, the administration, and the staff of the School of Medicine, I extend to each of you our heartiest congratulations and our warmest wishes for success and happiness. Thank you. And now I'd like to ask Michael Dowling, the CEO of Northwell Health, to come up for a few of his personal words. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very, very much. And um, first of all, let me say a special congratulations uh, to everybody. Um, as has been said, uh, what you have accomplished is absolutely extraordinary. And I also want to say a special congratulations to all of the family, friends, and other relatives, uh, some that are here and others that are not, uh, because they are all part of the cast that allowed you to be able to do what you were able to do over the last number of years. And I know you appreciate that, you understand that, because it takes more than one individual to do something. It's a team approach. And uh, I know at some point during the celebration, you will turn around and, and uh, say thanks to all the family members that are here for what they have done for you. This is indeed a special day. You know, it's the culmination of a dream that you've all had. And it is a day, obviously, to be exceptionally proud of what you have accomplished. This is also a special day that has been mentioned already by Dean Smith and President Rabinowitz. It's a special day because of the past year that we've been involved in. So if you reflect for a moment on the past year, now we had COVID, still has, have it, it's not all gone. We're turning the corner, it looks good, but we can't get complacent. But you look at the last year, there were a lot of things more than just COVID. We had a lot of racial tension. We witnessed a toxic political environment. We've witnessed and are still witnessing extraordinary economic dislocation. So many families, so many businesses, their lives disrupted some temporarily, some permanently. Over the past year, we have listened to an, you know, an addiction to misinformation and conspiracy theories, and on and on. So we're at a turning point. The world has changed. I don't think anybody that has gone through this past year is the same today as they were a year ago. Each one of us has been changed. Our perspective is different. Our perspective with regard to our families, our friends, our relatives, our perspective with regard to our role in the world, I believe, has changed. We're in a different place now. We're not going back. It includes healthcare, of course. Healthcare is different and will be different, but so will every other business. Every business that you know right now are pivoting and reimagining how they're going to adapt to a new normal. And that takes leadership. And you are the leaders of the future. You're entering a different world, but you're entering a world of extraordinary opportunity. Challenge, yes, but you always convert challenge into opportunity. You also have a responsibility that is large. People look up to you, your physicians, people trust you. People listen to you. People take your advice. People go to you for help. You have influence, not only in the medical field, but you have influence in the community at large. So the question as you pursue your education and you move into roles and leadership over time to ask yourself, what is my role in medicine to change it, to make it better? because we've, always, we've all observed during COVID the disproportionate effect that COVID had on certain populations, certain communities. These are all issues we need to address. We can't be satisfied with the great work that we did. We have to be focused on the work that we need to do going forward. But you also have a responsibility in the community at large. 
So I would just say in closing to you, first of all, again, congratulations. But I'd say to you, be a pioneer. Break new ground. Be perpetually optimistic. In the world that we've been going through and living through over the past year, we need to give oxygen to hope, to decency, to decency in our public discourse. We need to unify. We need to come together. We need to understand the concept of community, the interdependence of us all. We all succeed when everybody else around us also succeeds. So I'd say, as you go forward, make it your cause to change, make a distinctive difference in the world around you. And as you've already been doing, but I know, as I know you will continue to do, follow your dreams. Don't get frustrated. Follow your dreams. As uh, President Benowitz just said earlier, I remember the first meeting that he and I had in a restaurant when we talked about starting a medical school. And as he said, people looked around and said, you've got to be nuts. But look at where we are now. It demonstrates and proves Everything is possible. There can be no limits. It's all possible. And you can make it possible. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike. And now, could you please welcome to the stage the member of your class that you nominated to be the class feature speaker, Michael Catalano. Thank you, Dean Smith, President Urbinowitz, and Mr. Dowling for your leadership and your kind words. Thank you to all deans, faculty, and staff at the school for guiding us, mentoring us, educating us, and supporting us these last four years. Enormous thanks to my classmates uh, for the privilege of serving as class chair these last four years and for the honor of speaking today, for occasionally reading the weekly emails that I've spent the last 200 Sundays writing. Um, and for the friendships and support that made these last four years so memorable. And probably more important than any of those thanks, thank you to the people sitting behind you, family, friends, and loved ones. Without you, we wouldn't be at the stage in our lives and our medical journeys. Um, and I think I can speak on behalf of the entire class in saying thank you and we love you. And before I get to spend most of this speech talking about the amazing things that my classmates have and will accomplish, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge how challenging this last year in particular has been. Um, I don't want to dwell on hardship on a day of celebration, but I think it is important to recognize the strength and resilience of the 97 individuals graduating today to persist through all of it. It was a year plagued by a plague. Um, the pandemic has completely changed the world and the medical field as we know it, um, and it introduced uncertainty into a year that's probably one of the most uncertain and stressful times of our medical training. But we bent without breaking, and we adapted. We served patients on the front lines in the ICUs and the emergency room as acting interns. We learned how to Zoom, and we learned how to teach our older, I mean, more experienced faculty how to Zoom. Uh, we muted and we unmuted at the most inconvenient times, and we perfected our virtual interview backgrounds to interview and match at some of the top programs in the country. This was also a year plagued by overwhelming political tension and seemingly constant displays of racial injustice, not just blatantly through violence against black, brown, and Asian individuals, but structurally within the field that we're dedicating so much of ourselves to, and never more evident than seeing the disparities in COVID-19 outcomes. 
This injustice is as old as our history books, but it certainly received a new spotlight this past year, and it definitely wasn't easy to face. And I know that I'm saying this from a place of immense privilege, and I cannot begin to imagine the challenge that it was for my friends and my classmates and my mentors who have faced racial, ethnic, religious, or sexual prejudice in their own lives and their own medical journeys to not only persist through the challenges of medical school, as well as the new challenges spawned by the pandemic, but to take on the additional work of educating me and educating others, sharing their experiences, and enacting change in the school permanently through changes to our curriculum and to the education of future, future medical leaders. And while this year was more challenging than most, the last four years have been hard. They've required a tremendous amount of resilience and strength. There were highs, but there were also lows and bumps in the road. I'm sure everyone in this room has lost food from one of the fridges, whether it was from the infamous fridge thief of 2018 or one of class council's ruthless fridge cleaning sessions. There were many, many reply all email blunders, and oh, was there some Patagonia drama. Uh, some of the learning came easy, and other days we were ready to curse the self-directed curriculum and just wanted someone to tell us what the heck we needed to know. Some exams went well, and others left us disappointed. Life also happened. Families grew larger with puppies and weddings and babies, and people also lost loved ones, loved ones who would be here today cheering us on. And in those moments of hardship, the class came together in love and support, and when we persisted through it all. There were also some great memories along the road. For those of you who don't know, these 97 now doctors first got to know each other over open bars at a Times Square bowling alley and a Long Island Children's Museum. We shared the comfort and confusion of Mark greeting us each by name as we walked in on day one of orientation. We survived CPR, and then we realized that surviving BI was even more daunting. We appreciated Dr. Lucido and Dr. B's banter, making biochemistry and cell biology a little more palatable. We absorbed Dr. Miller's infectious energy for reproductive biology. We tried to emulate Dr. Wiener's kindness, and many of us awkwardly ultrasounded Dr. Rennie when the standardized patients were late to homeostasis exams. We made it through those two years, we grinded through ISP, we took trips around the country and the world, and then we came back just to be swallowed by the clinical responsibilities of third year. We got lost together, looking for the LIJ locker room in the North Shore Lounge. We, we appreciated the comfort that a head nod, a fist bump, or a smile from a classmate could provide during rounds. We literally never knew what to do with our hands or bodies in the OR. And of course, on a daily basis, we mis mispronounced everything because self-directed learning means we taught ourselves the wrong pronunciation. We were resilient through it all, through the highs and the lows, and we'll need to tap into that more than ever as we take this next step and start residency. There, the weight of the decisions we make will be greater than ever before, and there will be more asks of us than ever before. Patients will come to us with their greatest fears and their vulnerabilities, and people will trust us often more than we think that they should. And the responsibility doesn't end there with the patients. We'll also have a responsibility to the students who come after us. I'm sure everyone in this room has worked with that resident or that attending who either through being a great role model or a teacher or just great to be around has briefly made you want to change paths and start a different field. That will be us next year, scattering to different institutions, but working with students who have questions and concerns about the struggle that we know oh so well. And the responsibility doesn't end at the four walls of the hospital. Like the speakers before me, me have mentioned, our role in the community will change as well. Dean Smith even told us this during white coat ceremony, that when you take on the role of physician, the way people look to you will change. And now some of us, for some of us, physician will be the primary part of our identity, and for others it'll be a smaller part. But regardless, for the people who know, they'll look to you in a different light. And whether it's looking at your neighbor's rash reluctantly, or uh, providing your requested insight into a social or political manner, the way people look to you will change. You'll be a role model in the hospital, and you'll be a role model in the community. And I know everyone in this room is ready for that. Of course, I've seen you all role play clinical scenarios and empathize like Dr. Wiener. We've taken care of patients together, and I've seen the passion with which you pursue the things you care about in medicine and outside of medicine, from volunteering efforts to wellness. And more importantly than all that, I experienced it firsthand when I went through the hardest time of my life, losing my little cousin Ryan during second year, you all were there for me. Um, the outpouring of love and support from the class to me and to my family was so genuine and so helpful, and it's so reassuring to know that your patients will receive that same love and support. 
And while all of these responsibilities that I've described will be a heavy burden to carry, there's one more that should take priority over all of that, and that's the responsibility to yourselves and to care for yourselves. At a recent virtual conference, a cardiac surgeon asked a room full of medical students, what is the most important organ that the heart supplies? Answers of the brain and the lungs and the kidneys came in, all deemed incorrect. The answer was itself. In order to conduct the heart's selfless activity of providing oxygen and nutrients and life to the rest of the body, it must selfishly prioritize itself first. And that will be us next year. In order to take care of the patients and do the work that's asked of us, that'll be more than we've ever had to deal with before, we need to take care of ourselves first. I've been inspired by the way that you all are able to do that. And in times where I've gotten lost in the books, looking around to all of you and seeing the way with which you pursue your hobbies and your passions and your talents has been a really healthy and helpful reality check for myself. In this class, we have athletes, runners, bikers, hikers, climbers. We have musicians, singers, dancers, DJs, artists, photographers, gamers, chefs. The list could go on and on. We have veterans and those who are newly committing to serve in the military. Probably more impressive to me than all of that, we have people who are raising children and families. We have some interesting talents as well. We have Nicole, who can guess almost every baby photo in this class. We have Alex, who has a keen eye for memes and provided probably the only part of the weekly email that people actually scroll to. We have a Twitter superstar in Jeffers, who I'm really hoping retweets this so that I could experience his clout for a little while. All of this, like I said, has made a difference for me, seeing the way with which you pursued that, and I encourage you to continue making that all a priority. And before I conclude, I want to make two shout-outs to two very special individuals who I think epitomize all that I've just talked about and who have been a role model for me and I think a role model for many others in the class over the last few years. First is our Teacher of the Year, Dr. Elkowitz, who I hope is watching right now. When we started medical school, Dr. Elkowitz was a stranger to us who was just beginning to impress us with his ability to memorize the Robbins textbook and make pathology make sense when we received the heartbreaking email and notification that he'd been diagnosed with cancer. Yet after what felt like the briefest hiatus where he had a major thoracic surgery and a grueling chemotherapy regimen under his belt, he was here. He was on stage at White Coat. He was coaching us to think critically and he was using all of his own medical complications as teaching points for us. So much so that I think he even got into a little trouble for granting blanket access to all Zucker students to his whole medical record. That just shows how dedicated he was to our education. And if doing that all once wasn't enough, he went and had to kick cancer's butt a second time. So Dr. Elkowitz, thank you and we love you. Um, and second is our dear friend Anthony, who I'm very glad made it here today. Um, when courses and classrooms change, one constant is always Anthony's infectious energy and his infectious smile. Um, and Anthony, you displayed the most incredible strength and vulnerability in sharing your own battle with us um, and somehow managed to be such a great cheerleader for all of us from the sidelines. Uh, and so as you take this final lap around medical school fourth year, we'll be cheering for you and thank you too and we love you. So. I hope today everyone takes time to reflect on all that this class has accomplished, but also to be inspired by what this class will continue to accomplish. We will drive academia and innovation across specialties. We will reform medical education and the entire field as leaders. We will be incredible patient advocates and we will be well-rounded physicians and well-rounded people. Medicine is far from perfect today and there's a lot of work to be done but we can all leave reassured knowing that the future of medicine is in the hands of the 97 individuals in the class of 2021. It's been a privilege to complete this stage of my journey with all of you. Thank you again and congratulations. Thank you, Michael. That was great. And now we get to the legal part of this. It's called graduating you. Uh, the conferring of degrees, the passing out of diplomas. And so let me ask President Rabinowitz uh, to step forward. Will the candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy please rise? President Rabinowitz, I have the honor now to present to you the students who have satisfied all the requirements for the degree Doctor of Philosophy in the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine. 
at Hofstra Northwell. Maybe the MBPHDs up too. The MBPHDs yes. need to register. Yes. In, a, in addition, this includes those people who are receiving the PhD with their MD degree. President Rubinitz? Yes. Thank you. Have all the graduates, yes, you're all standing now? Okay. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the trustees of Hofstra University and the regents of the state of New York and upon the recommendation of the provost, Dean Smith, and the fabulous faculty of the medical school, I am delighted to confer upon you the degree Doctor of Philosophy. Congratulations. Dr. Betty Diamond, Program Director of the PhD and MD-PhD programs, will now honor the PhD graduates by name and project. But in deference to this year, those receiving both the MD and PhD degrees will come to the stage to collect their PhD diploma when their name is called for the MD diploma. Betty? So receiving a PhD is Andrew Stiegler. His thesis is entitled Effects of Choline Acetyl Transferase in a Murine Model of Hypertension, and his mentors were Sangeeta Chavan and Kevin Tracy. And receiving a PhD along with an MD this year is Adriana Chater Gata Garcia. Her thesis was entitled Sex Chromosomes and Gonadal Hormones Genesis and Rescue of Autism Spectrum Disorder Like Phenotypes and Mouse Models. And I was her mentor. And she'll receive her degree later. And Jimmy Hom. Uh, whose thesis is entitled RPS-19 Haploinsufficiencies Causes Severe Skeletal Defects in Mouse Models of Diamond Black Fan Anemia, and his mentor was uh, Leo Blanc. And Ping Wang Yang, where's Ping? Uh, whose thesis is entitled Focal Adhesion Kinase Regulates the Generation and Function of CD8 Regulatory Cells, and his mentor uh, was Yangri Zhu. So if all of you receiving the PhD will rise, and all Others with PhDs, all MD graduates with distinction in researcher in research, and all researchers will also rise. Please join me in reciting the oath of the scientist. The oath is on the second to last page of your program. So all MDs receiving distinction in research, please also rise and recite with me. By accepting my Doctor of Philosophy degree, I earnestly assert I will apply my scientific skills and principles to benefit society. I will continue to practice and support a scientific process that is based on logic, intellectual rigor, personal integrity, and an uncompromising respect for truth. I will treat my colleagues' work with respect and objectivity and be a collaborator within the scientific community, sharing knowledge and resources resulting from my research. I will teach these scientific principles to my students. I will seek to increase public understanding of the principles of science and its humanitarian goals. We know how important that is from this year. These things I do promise. Congratulations. Thank you, Betty. 
Will the candidates for the degree of Doctor of Medicine please rise? President Rabinowitz, I have the honor now to present to you those students who have satisfied all the requirements for the degree Doctor of Medicine in the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, and I am pleased to join with the faculty in recommending that you confer the degree Doctor of Medicine upon these candidates. Graduates, by virtue of the authority vested in me, by the trustees of Hofstra University and by the Regents of the State of New York, and upon the recommendation of Dean Smith and the faculty of the law school, I am so delighted to confer upon you your degree, Doctor of Medicines. Congratulations. We ask that each of the graduates come to the stage to be introduced by Dr. Ellen Perlman, Associate Dean for Professionalism and Doctoring Skills, to receive their diplomas. Dr. Sara J. Abrams. Dr. Wasik Matin Akben. Dr. Zohaib M. Baga. Dr. Samuel D. Butensky, degree conferred with distinction in research, also the recipient of the Department of Surgery Graduate Award. <laughs> Dr. Christina E. Castagna. Dr. Michael A. Catalano, degree conferred with distinction in research, recipient of the Student Leadership Award and the Department of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery Department Award. <laughs> Dr. Adriana V. Chedergata Garcia, receiving both her MD and her PhD degrees. Dr. Kathleen T. Cheng. Dr. Omoyeni O. Clement, recipient of the very well-received Branson Sparks Humanism Award and the Department of Emergency Medicine Graduate Award. Dr. Erica Dayen Cohn, the recipient of the Department of Medicine Graduate Award. <laughs> Dr. Tamar Ariella Levy Daco. <laughs> Dr. Cyril Joy Daniel Cuddy. Dr. Christy David Ramphal. Dr. Morgan Emily Doolin. Dr. Holly M. Dupuy. Dr. Catherine M. Ekobachi. Dr. Matthew I. Ehrlich degree conferred with distinction in research. Dr. Madhavan Alangavan. Dr. Kate G. Farber, recipient of the Department of Family Medicine Graduate Award. Dr. Dylan Rachel Gercillo. Dr. Grace K. Ha, degree conferred with distinction in research. Dr. Rachel E. Hainline. Dr. Jimmy Hom, receiving both his MD and PhD degrees.
Dr. Peter Shea. Dr. Wei Cheng Huang. Dr. Arushi Jahari. Dr. Sharon Klein, degree conferred with distinction in research. Dr. Ezra Benjamin Kolitz. Dr. Danielle Janos. Dr. Christopher Mark Lucarelli, recipient of the Department of Psychiatry Graduate Award. Dr. Nanette L. Matos. Dr. Juan Andre Maury. Dr. Spiros A. Mavropoulos. Dr. Tamara Mufseseva. Dr. Brittany Elizabeth Nathan. Dr. Vicente Andres Nigma. Nigme. <laughs> Dr. Eric V. Neufeld, degree conferred with distinction in research. <laughs> Dr. Terrence Ng. Dr. Tommy H. Wynn, degree conferred with distinction in research. <laughs> Dr. Brian Joseph O'Donnell, recipient of the Department of Anesthesia Graduate Award. Dr. Janae Esedet Parrish, recipient of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation Graduate Award. <laughs> Dr. Navin Pathak. <laughs> Dr. Robert Christopher Penna, degree conferred with distinction in research. <laughs> Dr. Kenneth Andrew Piscina. Piscino. <laughs> Dr. Nicole Marie Quattrochi. Dr. John Michael Reed. Dr. Timothy F. Reed. Dr. Kevin R. Richardson. Dr. Melanie B. Rivera. Applause 
Dr. Joshua D. Roberts. Dr. William L. Roberts. Dr. Elise April Rooney. Dr. Daniel Porcelli Russo, Department of Otolaryngology Graduate Award. Dr. Abel A. Semenes. Dr. Tabia Leila Santos. Dr. Benjamin Charles Schaffler, degree conferred with distinction in research and recipient of the Do Department of Orthopedic Surgery Graduate Award. Dr. Clayford Mario Senra. Dr. Gilbert Shi. Dr. David Hunter Sloan. Dr. Danielle F. Soberman. Dr. Rachel L. Salmanovich. Dr. Anoop N. Santi, degree conferred with distinction in research and recipient of the Department of Neurology Graduate Award. Dr. Marcel Raymond Souffron. Dr. Alexander Maxwell Spring, degree conferred with distinction in research, recipient of the Department of Cardiology Graduate Award. Dr. Blaine Patrick Stannard, degree conferred with distinction in research. Dr. Ross Tyler Stuber, degree conferred with distinction in research, recipient of the Department of Ophthalmology Graduate Award. Dr. Melissa E. Tabor. Dr. Jose Miguel Torres, recipient of the Department of Urology Graduate Award. Dr. Mika Adi Uffenheimer. Dr. Claire Valberg. Dr. Juana T. Vargas. Dr. Catherine Wong. Dr. Tiffany Liu Wang. <laughs> Dr.
Dr. Shari Ayana Wright, degree conferred with distinction in research and recipient of the Department of Dermatology Graduate Award. Dr. Grace Wu. Dr. Jeff Ying. Dr. Pingguang Yang, receiving both his MD and PhD degrees. Dr. Song C. Yun. Dr. Karina Y. Zhang. Dr. Henry T. Zhang. And now joining us virtually, Go ahead. Dr. Sa Sasha Alcon, recipient of the Department of Pediatrics Graduate Award. Dr. James A. Alsate, recipient of the Dean's Recognition Award. <laughs> Dr. Denny D. Cha. <laughs> Dr. Cassandra A. Gross. Dr. Shruti Koti, degree conferred with distinction in research. Dr. Sarah Liss Hertzberg, new baby. <laughs> Dr. Jeffers Kiet Wynn, recipient of the Department of Radiology Graduate Award. <laughs> Dr. Sarah Wong, recipient of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology Graduate Award. And last but not least, Dr. William Yang. Congratulations. Okay, let's have one more round of applause for all these new doctors. I will now ask Dr. David Battinelli to lead you in reciting an adaptation of the modern Hippocratic Oath, the same oath you took at your white coat ceremony, October 23rd, 2017. We invite all physicians in the room to rise and join the graduates in this tradition. You can find the oath on the last page of the program. Dave. Okay, if you'll read along with me. I swear to fulfill to the best of my ability and judgment this covenant. I will respect the hard-won scientific gains of those physicians in whose steps I walk 
and gladly share such knowledge as is mine with those who are to follow. I will apply for the benefit of the sick all measures that are required, avoiding those twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic nihilism. I will remember that there is art to medicine as well as science, and that warmth, sympathy, and understanding may outweigh the surgeon's knife or the chemist's drug. I will not be ashamed to say, I know not, nor will I fail to call in my colleagues when the skills of another are needed for a patient's recovery. I will respect the privacy of my patients, for their problems are not disclosed to me that the world may know. Most especially must I tread with care in matters of life and death, and never abuse the power that has been bestowed upon me. I will remember that I do not treat a fever chart, a cancerous growth, but a sick human being whose illness may affect not only the person, but a family and community. I will prevent disease wherever I can, for prevention is preferable to cure. I will remember that I remain a member of society with special obligations to all my fellow human beings, those sound of mind and body, as well as the infirm. I will maintain the health of my own mind, body, and spirit so I am able to discharge my duties appropriately. If I do not violate this oath, may I enjoy life and art, respected while I live and remembered with affection thereafter. May I always act so as to preserve the finest traditions of my calling, and may I long experience the joy of healing those who seek my help. Congratulations. Please be seated. So I'm always struck by the fact that during the times that I went to graduation myself, I never understood why they kept calling it commencement. I figured I should be celebrating my accomplishments, not looking forward to what was going to happen to me tomorrow. But there could be no graduation where more clearly it is a commencement than medical school. Because before today, you were a medical student struggling to become a doctor. And tomorrow, you are a doctor struggling to figure out what that means. And of course, what that means is that you're still at the beginning of the learning curve of becoming a competent specialist or generalist in whatever field you're going into. But from now on, you only learn in the presence of patients and stimulated by their needs and the things that you don't know that you must learn. And so what does that mean? Well, first of all, it means you better be very comfortable saying, I don't know, out loud. Because without saying that, you'll pretend. And it's a little bit dangerous to pretend that you know something when we're dealing with real patients. In addition, the only real metric of how successful you are will be how your patients respond to your care. You can, you can have colleagues who will pat you on the back because you remind them of them, but your patients will know whether you really care about them or whether you're just going through the motions. They may not know how talented you are, they may not know how smart you are, but they will always know how much you care. Take my word for it, and remember that as you approach patients. You're gonna have all kinds of reasons to become cynical. You're going to be overworked. You're going to get tired. You're going to get stressed. You're going to look for the resilience that isn't there. You're going to realize that you started the day with a pocket full of empathy, and the empathy is all gone. And you still have hours more work to do. And how do those patients who, after your empathy is drained, not suffer from a physician who doesn't have empathy. How do you reach down and dig into that pocket and get that last bit of empathy so that every patient knows you care and begins to trust you? And that's a real challenge. Let me tell you, it's not easy. And then how do you get ready for the future of medicine that isn't going to look like what you just experienced? Whether it's molecular science, directing care in such precise scientific ways that is very different than anything we experienced before. Whether it's big and little data that tells you whether you're a good or a bad physician, at least on paper, 
where we collect information about everyone, where computers are supposed to have artificial intelligence that will clearly be much more likely to recognize the odd and rare disease than the physician practicing in a common practice. What do we do about new technology? I lived in an era where I watched technology develop, but you're going to live in an era where you watch technology get clipped to the patient. And every minute of every day, the patient with serious diseases is going to be generating data. And how do you manage that? How do you use it? How do you turn that into an advantage instead of just an overwhelming burden? Medical information is no longer private property of the doctor. But unfortunately, the sources that many patients use are fraught with misinformation as much as correct information. And that's going to be a challenge of how to deal with that without disparaging the patient, keeping their trust while telling them what you believe is the correct answers to, que to the questions that they posed to their computer, their next door neighbor, their friend, their relative, and now to you, their doctor. These are big challenges, but they pale in comparison to what you saw happen this year. We figured out that this social determinants of health is not just an interesting public health way of looking at the world. It is a reality of unbelievable suffering, illness, and death in communities where the social infrastructure, the resources, are not equal to the other areas where people have those things. And no one is going to anymore say that dealing with the social determinants of health is just the government job or the public health job. They're going to say it's your job because it is so obvious that it's going to influence the health and the likelihood of recovery of every one of your patients. And that's going to be something that you're going to have to think through and learn with others how to actually take on that role. How to have a cadre of consultants who can be consulted for helping with the social determinants of health, not just the super specialties of medicine. Because if we don't do that, we're never going to solve good health for the whole country. And no one, if you're going to be a scientist or a clinical scientist or a clinical trialist, no one will ever again let you do trials that are not inclusive of the diversity of this country. Because in trials that do not include diversity, we just make fatal mistakes to the efficacy of new therapeutics. So this is a new world and it's going to be really, really important that you learn how to function in it at a level of excellence that you, you feel satisfies you and your patients. So the first thing I want to say, and the last thing, is hang on to the altruism that got you to medical school. Remember that it is always a privilege, even when it seems like the most fatiguing job you ever said yes to. It is a privilege to have people trust you when they're at their most vulnerable. So hanging on to that altruism, I'm going to read you one of my favorite poems. And if you've been at previous graduations, you know that I particularly like William Stafford's poem, The Way It Is. William Stafford was a po poet laureate in the United States for a number of years. He wrote 2,000 poems that were published. He wrote every morning of his adult life. And 26 days before he died, he wrote this poem but I think it has special relevance to people who arrive altruistic to medical school and how to preserve it. There's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it's hard for others to see. While you hold on to it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen people get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you can do can stop times unfolding. You can never let go of the thread. And that is my wish for you, that you never let go of the thread that brought you to medicine, and that your life will be as fulfilled as it should be, having the privilege to take care of patients at their most vulnerable. And so I'll leave you with that thought and congratulate you again. And now careful instructions so we don't violate the law leaving this building. 
We will now escort the graduates outside they, so that they can meet the family members and friends to celebrate. We ask that you, the people up in the, uh, up in the seats, don't sit there waiting for a basketball game because it's not going to happen. You will see the doors open at the top of each section and just follow the ushers and you'll be escorted out of the building safely, keeping your distance, and congratulations to you, the class of 2021 Zucker School of Medicine.